Good afternoon. My name is Carolyn Wang Kong, and I am the Chief Program Director at Blue Shield of California Foundation. Our mission is to make California the healthiest state in the nation and end domestic violence. Over the past two months, we've all been affected by the pandemic, but not equally. For those of us who've been not only able to keep our jobs, but also work from home, we've had the good fortune of being able to substantially reduce risks to ourselves and our families. The people who can work from home are typically higher earners. According to the Pew Research Center, over 60% of workers who earn $90,000 and up can telework versus 40% of workers earning $89,000 or less. We've also seen that many members of what we now call the essential workforce are at the front lines of disease prevention, while they often have the fewest protections and resources. Things like health insurance, paid leave, workers' compensation, and even personal protective equipment. Many of these jobs are filled by women, people of color, people in low wealth communities, and people in immigrant communities who are less likely to be able to weather the financial crisis, who are more likely to live in multi-generational housing, and who often care for members of their family and community and protect them from COVID-19. This special virtual Commonwealth Club program will look at the important work that takes place in this care economy and the intersection of health and income inequities. Blue Shield of California Foundation is proud to sponsor this program as part of the Commonwealth Club of California's overall efforts to focus on how the pandemic is impacting our communities. We know that people of different backgrounds experience the pandemic differently based on race, gender, income, and age. We also know that people who perform perhaps the most important function in our society, caring for people, are at the highest risk of income insecurity and exposure to disease. They're more likely to rely on public transportation, less likely to have the resources to stock up on groceries, which means more trips to the store, less likely to have paid time off and other factors. In short, Care workers are burdened with both more of the work to reduce COVID-19 and more of the risk. Today, we'll learn more about what these care workers are facing and the steps that need to be taken to create a healthier California for all. With that, I am pleased to turn the program over to KQED's Sam Harnett, who will be the moderator for today's program. Sam has covered a range of workforce issues during the pandemic, including a few pieces on care workers. I'm pleased to turn the program over to him. Again, on behalf of everyone at Blue Shield of California Foundation, we are proud to support this program. Sam? Thanks, Carolyn, for that introduction. And thank you, Blue Shield of California, for supporting this program. And thank you to the Commonwealth Club for bringing us all together virtually, as we do now. Uh, to discuss this important subject. And uh, this is really important to discuss now, as Carolyn was saying. Um, yeah, before the pandemic, uh, my role at KQD was covering tech and labor. Uh, and after the pandemic, I am now entirely covering labor. And, and as Carolyn was saying, the, the situation that workers in America are in right now is, is horrific. I mean, there's any number of stats that you can pick to talk about what workers are going through. Um, you know, just one or two things, uh, uh, a stat that I came across in my reporting is that only 4% of all workers have 14 or more paid sick days. Um, another stat to look at is, is minimum wage. Uh, if you adjust for inflation, minimum wage today is $5 less than it was decades ago. Um, there are less unions, there's less protections. Uh, you see more gig workers uh, out in the world who, who have even, they lack even the basic uh, employee protections that people used to have. So these are the kinds of things I'm reporting on now. Um, and some things that I wanted to just put out there, uh, some questions to think as we talk about healthcare workers, uh, and that I've been thinking about in my reporting is, is why do we live in a society where workers have so little? Why do we live in a society uh, where we prioritize shareholder profit over wage holder earnings? Uh, why do we live in a society where essential workers have no savings and they have debt and they don't have good healthcare and they don't make enough money to to stock up on, on supplies and, and take a couple months off to, to weather out this pandemic. I mean, these are the kinds of the questions that, you know, there, there are answers to, and, and I feel like uh, in the discussion today, I hope we'll, we'll touch on some of them. Uh, now, before the pandemic started, uh, I did not know uh, about in-home supportive uh, uh, care. 
uh, workers. It was, it was not a, a, a worker that I was aware of. And in California, there are hundreds of thousands of people who, are, who work in in-home supportive services. Um, these people are in the community. They're often taking care of, of friends and family. And they often make less than minimum, or they often make minimum wage or maybe a dollar or two uh, over that. Uh, and they usually have only a day off uh, a year, if that. Um, so another big question I want to think about today is, is, A, why do these workers make so little? Why do they get so little support? And B, why, do, again, do we live in a society where uh, we have so much, so little time to take care of our, our friends and family that are sick? Again, a lot of these care workers are doing tasks, uh, taking care of a family member. Uh, and again, we're in a society where people are working so hard and make so little, they don't have time to take care of their mother or their sister or, uh, or a friend who's ill. Um, and so before I get started, I wanted to uh, uh, introduce the two, two uh, women who will be joining us, Amanda Steele and uh, Kim Alvaranga. Uh, uh, Kim is the director of the California Domestic Workers Coalition. It's an organization that was originally created to address the needs of domestic workers that were originally left out of most uh, basic worker protections. Um, she has over 20 years of experience growing the economic and political power of underrepresented communities, and she herself is the daughter of an immigrant domestic worker. Thanks for joining us, Kim. And we also have Amanda Steele. She's joining us from Los Angeles, where she works for the SEIU Local 2015 as the Deputy Policy Director. Her team supports members who are long-term care workers by advocating at the state and local levels for policies and regulations that advance the standards for the long-term care workforce. So thanks for joining us, Amanda. I couldn't think of two uh, better people to join us to talk about all these issues. Um, before we get in uh, with questions, uh, I wanted to play you all just one uh, small radio piece that I did for KQED. Um, and, all, and before I do that, I also want to let you know that if you do have questions uh, for any of the panelists, you can use the YouTube chat feature. If you put a question in there, uh, it'll be submitted to me throughout the program, and I'll try to ask as many of those questions as possible. So yeah, the first thing I just, I think it's really important for us to actually hear from a healthcare uh, worker herself. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a story that I did for KQED, and it's a profile of a woman named Carnella Marks, who is an in-home uh, supportive service worker. So take a listen, it's gonna be about three, three and a half minutes. So there are doctors and nurses in hospitals and clinics, and then there are roughly half a million in-home supportive service workers here in California. Counties pay them to take care of people in their homes, sometimes even their own relatives. Most of them make around minimum wage, and they get only one paid day off a year. Now, as KQED's Sam Harnett tells us, they're asking for help, specifically masks and hazard pay. Carnella Marx takes care of her 71-year-old father-in-law, Albert, who lives with her family. He has advanced dementia from Alzheimer's, along with heart and cholesterol problems. But he was doing much worse before he came to live with them. The doctors basically told us to go make funeral arrangements. Instead, Marx brought him back to her home in Chico and got to work. Since we got him from the hospital, he's been progressing. He's walking with assistance. He's talking more. And he had lost a lot of weight. He's picking his weight back up. Marx has been caring for different people in Butte County since 2016 and for years before that in Louisiana. It's a 24-7 job with her father-in-law now. Albert is mostly incapacitated. She gives him medication, walks him around for exercise, and feeds and bathes him. When I'm trying to change him sometime, if he has made a bowel movement, he'll try to sit down in the midst of me cleaning him, and sometimes he'll... Put his hand back there, so if I don't catch it in time, that's more cleaning I got to do. The coronavirus outbreak has made this job so much harder. Marx is now constantly wiping Albert's room down with disinfectant that she has to buy herself. Luckily, she says she has some masks left over from the campfire a few years ago, so she's using those. Then she has to make sure her kids, 13-year-old twins, do not bring germs into his room. On top of all this, Marx says she's not getting extra pay for all the extra work. We're not getting the additional hours for the additional care since the virus outbreak, but we're having to work continuously. Some of her friends in the business say they're being asked not to work because without protective gear, they could bring the virus into clients' homes. 
The United Domestic Workers Union represents 117,000 workers in 21 counties. It's trying to get unemployment insurance guaranteed permanently for these workers, who are getting it temporarily because of the federal coronavirus bill. It's also pushing for counties to increase pay, add sick time, and hire extra staff to fill in. Mark says not a lot of people want to do this job for minimum wage. Like I said, you working with a person with dementia, you may find yourself with stuff on you, you know, body fluids or whatever, and a lot of people don't want to work with that. With the union, Marx has been negotiating with Butte County for over five years to get a modest pay raise. To get by, Marx and her husband work additional jobs. On every weekday between midnight and 2 a.m., they clean a local community center for $125 a week. My body in the morning sometimes tell me don't get out the bed. But I have to keep going, you know, I I have to. I love what I do. I love helping people. To keep helping people right now, she says, she just needs a little help herself. For the California Report, I'm Sam Harnett. Governor Newsom recently had a Zoom call with in-home supportive service workers, including Carnella. And he's now shipping them masks. No word yet on their request for increased pay. All right, I want to open this up by asking Amanda and Kim just to to comment on that video and what Carnella Marks and some of the other workers are going through. Hi, thanks, Sam. Um, I'll just start a little bit about our union, uh, SEIU Local 2015. So we represent over 300,000 of the IHSS workers that were mentioned in the video across the state. And I think that a lot of what was said in that video really touches on what so many IHSS workers are experiencing around struggling with wages and paid sick leave, especially now. And um, one of our biggest issues that we face in, you know, bringing up the wages and benefits is the fact that we are doing it on a county by county basis. So as you can imagine, California, 58 counties, it's not exactly easy. And it can be a very different experience from county to county on what the local governments are willing to um, give to those workers. So it is a constant struggle for that. And we're really seeing that highlighted more and more now during the pandemic, when these workers are caring for the population that is most at risk for getting the virus. They're in personal close contact providing care, and they're the ones that are being exposed. And yet, for many years, they weren't really recognized as those essential workers that they're being called now. So we're really trying to put the spotlight on that issue and say they've always been essential workers. It's just now become apparent because of the situation we're in, unfortunately. And Amanda, I want to return to that uh, later in the program to talk about this idea that's broken down county by county. Because when I was reporting on this, I found that very confusing and it was hard to understand. Different counties had different relationships with those workers and they paid them different amounts. And they had different contracts. So yeah, I want to return to that later on. Um, but Kim, yeah, what, what, what's your reaction? <clears throat> well, thank you so much, Sam, for having, having us. We really appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, I represent, uh, we're the leading voice for the 300,000 domestic workers in California that are not part of the IHSS Uh, group of workers. It's amazing and a wonderful thing that they can organize um, workers, but there are workers that are outside of those groups that are experiencing the same situation um, that Amanda just just talked about. Um, You know, with the 300,000 domestic workers that um, work one-on-one in private settings, um, most of them are immigrant women, as you saw on the show. Most of them are uh, women of color, Um, as Amanda also mentioned, that have been historically excluded back in the 1930s when we uh, won a lot of labor protections for workers. Um, There were two industries that were excluded from basic protections at that time. And one of those industries was domestic workers and the other one was farm workers. Um, And unfortunately, it really is because of a legacy of racism at the time. Most Uh, domestic workers at the time were African-American. And so policymakers didn't want to 
extend those rights to those to those workers at the time. So ever since then, um, we've actually been advocating uh, along with our union brothers and sisters to to get equity, um, really, and to also I want I would love to say that to also like bring remind us about the value of caregiving um, right. and how important the work really is. Yeah, so we have really two fragile systems here. Uh, we have the IHSS, which is, uh, you know, kind of through the county uh, and has some union support. And then we have all the domestic workers, like you were saying, Kim, a lot of them are undocumented um, and don't even have the protection of a union. And both of these were fragile, kind of terrible systems before the pandemic. But like we're seeing so much with the pandemic now, it's exposing how bad it really was and how uh, fragile it really is. Um, I did another story for KQED about domestic workers. Uh, and these are so many people who, uh, once the pandemic started, uh, people were like, oh, actually, I don't want you to come take care of my kids or, 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 uh, or you know, clean my house. But these workers couldn't collect unemployment. And so they were in a really, really difficult position. Um, so Kimberly, you brought up a really good point. Um, yeah, uh, I, I guess if we start with the IHSS workers, what could be done to help those workers? And then after that, Kim, I always talk to you about what could be done to help uh, domestic workers who, who, as you were saying, don't, you know, don't even have a union. Right. So for IHSS, I mean, there's a lot that can be done. We have been able to achieve some wins recently during the pandemic. Um, they are um, eligible for the federal paid sick leave that's in the Federal CARES Act. So that's huge for our IHSS population because, as was mentioned, they typically only get one or two sick days a year. And it's very difficult for them to take that time off because you need to get a backup provider. And if you're a family caregiver, that's even more difficult for you to find someone to come into the home and take over. Um, so what we really need is for whatever standards that we're asking for now during the pandemic, we want to make sure that that is in place going forward. So when we talk about hazard pay, that's really important right now in this moment where workers are in extra high risk because of the situation, but we need to make sure that that conversation doesn't end once the crisis ends and that the wages are really continuing to be reflective of the work that they're doing going forward. And yeah, you uh, you don't want to happen with what happened with Amazon, where it's like, oh, here's an extra dollar or two, and oh, actually, now that's over, so go back to work. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, you know, workers come to rely on that money, and then, yeah, if you take that away, that's a huge economic burden on those workers for any worker. So I think that that is one of the huge things going forward is what are we, what do we want the landscape for this workforce to look like? in the future beyond this pandemic, because as I mentioned, the county by county system already creates a lot of difficulties where counties, certain counties are at minimum wage, certain counties are higher, it's kind of all over the place. So, you know, is there some sort of standard where we raise everyone throughout the state and no one gets left behind because they happen to live in a really rural county where there's some budgetary issues or, you know, unfriendly politics? Um, and then, you know, just looking at the overall like benefit system, I know unemployment came up in that video because right now temporarily IHSS workers are eligible for unemployment. It used to be that if you were a parent or spouse provider, you were exempt, you could not get unemployment and that's temporary, temporarily lifted because of COVID. But again, we want to make sure that that's a permanent solution that those benefits that every other worker gets that why is IHSS always excluded? We had to fight to get any sort of paid sick leave for them. We had to fight to get overtime for them a few years ago. They used to be exempt from that because they're classified as domestic workers. So it's always feeling like they're getting left behind and it's, you know, thinking forward, how do we change that so that they're always, you know, we're not always coming back to these same issues when there's an emergency. Right. And Amanda, I want to return to you uh, and talk about uh, 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 IHS work, S workers and protective equipment and what they're going through during the houses and stuff. Um, but Kim, yeah, I want to, let, let's talk about domestic workers. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, follow up on the comment that you made prior, Sam, about um, the, the vulnerability of domestic workers during this time. Um, this pandemic has been catastrophic 
um, to workers that primarily are undocumented. Um, it has revealed, as you mentioned, um, very quickly an employer can say, you know, I don't, I, I can't have you come, come to the house, right? Because our health and safety is in jeopardy. Uh, uh, correct to do so, you know, but it has also revealed a number of things. It's been catastrophic because it has impacted our base um, in such a horrible way. Um, the workers we work with don't have an economic safety net. Um, they're not able to apply for any government benefit. Um, they're not eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, and um, from one day to the next, you know, they um, don't have absolutely any income coming in. Um, and I have to say, in the midst of this administration, um, the fear of having a lot of members engage with any governmental agency for any kind of support is pretty overwhelming. Um, so that impact um, has just been felt across the board with our membership. In addition to that, as Amanda mentioned, we have like so many of our members um, have been exposed to COVID-19. Um, again, they work in private home settings. Many of them also work for agencies that get sent out to private homes. Some of them um, also have multiple jobs. They do house cleaning where they can be exposed. Um, they work for the agencies. Uh, some of them also work for residential care facilities. Many of them have been sent home without be, being told whether the people they were caring for were positive uh, to then find out that they were and they had passed away. Um, and so then our members go home and infect the communities that they live in. And unfortunately, I don't, we're in San Francisco. We know how difficult housing is. You know, many of our members live in a room with maybe another family, you know, and then they're exposing that family. So um, health and safety um, is really an important issue right now for domestic workers. Um, and also the economic safety net um, is something we've also been working on. So uh, the story that I did about a domestic worker, uh, it was a nanny. And uh, when I interviewed her, her employer had said, listen, I don't want you to come in, but I'm going to continue paying you because I know the government's not going to uh, cover you and because you're undocumented. Uh, and when I interviewed that nanny, she said it was so hard for her to take that money and she was so upset, right? Um, and it just made me think that there's been so much conditioning that um, that, that kind of help is wrong and that, that you know, you shouldn't take money for not working uh, when really there, there's this entire predatory system, which a lot of privileged people in this country have been benefiting from, which is having... Uh, a undocumented workforce that they can have when they need and drop when they don't. Um, so I just, I guess I want to ask you, Kim, like, I mean, this, I, I know how I feel about this morally and ethically, but should people just be paying these workers uh, if there's a dangerous situation and they can't work? Well, I can speak, you know, we work with um, employers. Uh, we work in partnership with Hand in Hand, the Domestic Worker Employers Network that does a lot of um, outreach and education to employers. The two million households in California that actually employ domestic workers in the state. And many of those workers um, are very good people. Um, you know, it's not a law that says that they have to provide support. I can speak from my own personal experience. My mother also has dementia and I have a caregiver that comes in who can't come in at the time. And I also provided my version of unemployment insurance for her. And right. she, she sobbed, like she literally, um, couldn't get the words out of her mouth because all she was able to tell me was that she was basically down to her last penny. Right. Um, and so... I think these are really important conversations to have, but I think the bigger conversation is around structural change, you know, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, really um, getting to a place where we can see these women as workers. Um, Cause once we can internalize that they really are workers, that they have value, that they should be respected um, and then see ourselves as an employer and that we have a responsibility in that relationship. Um, it's one step towards um, long-term structural change. And right. I know that takes time. Yeah, two important points there. Uh, if you are the employer uh, and you have an employee, like let's say you reframe the idea of you have your, your nanny and your house cleaner, but they're your employees. And an employer plays unemployment insurance for their employees in the case that there is a pandemic, that employee is going to be protected. As a society, we decided that employees should have that 
So why should domestic workers not have that? Um, so I think it's a really good point. Uh, the second point being uh, the burden of uh, uh, an individual sudden, you know, r relying on the, the charity and good nature of others to save us right now. And I, again, I, you know, I interviewed a lot of people who had nannies and, and house cleaners, and they were making the choice to make that payment. But if we have a society where we just rely on someone's goodwill, that is not the kind of structural change that's going to ensure uh, that every, that that this is there's positive change. I mean, I think about that myself. Like, how often you say you're going to do the right thing, and then no one's looking. You're like, well, <laughs> you know. I mean, it seems hard to rely on us all to make the, the right decision. Um, so, Amanda, I want to return to IHSS workers and the, the uh, protective gear because this is actually kind of a similar thing, right? Like we. We would never send a surgeon in to do surgery without the proper gear, uh, but somehow someone taking care of a patient at home, we sort of don't think of in the same way. Is that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of people didn't think of that. Um, I mean, the, the medical providers that are in hospitals and doctor's office, I mean, they're all incredible people. And obviously we want them to have the protection, but like you said, there are over, there's close to half a million um, in-home caregivers in California, and they are taking care of people that are sick, that are elderly, that have chronic conditions. So it just, when you really think about it, it is pretty absurd that they didn't immediately have the, the protective equipment that they need. It's only very recently that the state started sending out masks and gloves to counties to be distributed. But of course, all of this takes a lot of time and everything is very disjointed throughout the state. So you might work in a county that's pretty well oiled and you're going to be able to pick up your mask right away, no problem. But maybe you work in a county where it's a lot more difficult or they just don't have enough masks. So, you know, we've really seen that impact our members directly. That's probably the biggest issue that they have faced from the beginning of all this is getting the protection they need because once they're infected if you live with the person you're caring for what are you supposed to do um and then it goes back to the whole economic situation of these workers you know we've heard that some healthcare workers are um, isolating themselves in a hotel room because they don't want to spread it to their family but Mostly IHSS workers don't really have the luxury to do that, um, and they don't have someone else to come in to care for their family member. So it gets really complicated when they don't have the, that protective equipment that they desperately need. Um, and I'll just give a little plug to our nursing home workers, too, which is kind of the other side of things. Mm -hmm. We represent that class of workers, too, and they're facing the same issues um, without having that PPE and having all these COVID patients come in. And it's been an absolute nightmare to try and get them the protection they need to. So we're really seeing it. It's, um, I think Kimberly really touched on it and the fact that we're talking about a workforce that is largely women, people of color, um, low income workers. So they just are really have not been the priority around getting this equipment distributed to them, yet they are the ones that need it maybe the most or at least one of the the, the highest need groups. So it's just right. really been difficult to for our members to deal with this and having to still work. They don't really, they can't just say, I'm not going to go to work or right. Um, it just doesn't work like that. Yeah, you can imagine Carnella, who's going to take care of her father-in-law if she isn't doing it, you know? I mean, yeah, exactly. It, really, exactly. And um, we know a lot of our IHSS workers, even if they, even if their recip care recipient is only getting a certain amount of hours, we know that many times the care provider goes above and beyond and provides unpaid hours because obviously they're not going to let that person not get all the care they need and be at risk for, you know, an emergency. Yeah, and I want to back up and just like, uh, I feel like right now with the pandemic, it's really important to try to think about how we got to this situation. I mean, it's a mess, right? Like both with domestic workers and IHSS workers uh, and people working in retirement homes. So I want to try to take a step back and just figure out how we got into this mess. Um, and yeah, first with IHSS workers, I think about this, again, if we lived in a different society and your, your mother or your father or your brother got sick, uh, and the society supported you, maybe you could take time off from work and, and care for that person yourself. 
But we all, you know, who in, who in America has the luxury to say, hey, I'm not going to work for six months. And their employer be like, yeah, you'll be hired when you come back. Um, so, so, so given that, um, uh, how is the IHSS system developed? Like how have the problems developed uh, over the years? Because right now, so, so the, the government solution, right, was to pay a little bit of money to someone in, uh, in the house to care for that, for that worker or for that person. Um, but again, there's all these, it's, it's done by county. It seems like to be a total kind of mess. Right. And this has existed for a long time. And Kimberly touched on it earlier, the fact that these workers really, even now, I, I mean, they're recognized a little bit more now. It's gotten better. But by and large, they're considered, you know, domestic housekeepers that don't do essential work. Um, and so they really haven't been valued for a long time. And I think a lot of people don't understand the services that they provide and the fact that they're keeping people safely at home. And if you really want to look at the economic side of it, they are saving the state money. Um, you know, if, if you don't think the work is valuable, at least from a financial perspective, it actually saves the state money to have people remain at home and get that care. Um, so I think just the way that the system was built, those problems were just there from the start, the way that right. it was built upon saying these are domestic workers that are just babysitters. They're glorified babysitters. Right. They, they don't get overtime. They don't get sick time. They don't get vacation. They don't, they can't take time off. They're caring, they're getting paid to care for their family members. So people see that as not a normal, typical job that should right. get the same benefits as everyone else. And so we've had to fight for a long time. It's been, you know, getting a couple days of paid sick leave. Uh, just two years ago, we were able to win that. And there's still a long way to go. As we said, we still want to get to somewhere like the two weeks that we're seeing in the federal bill. Uh, yeah. They only started getting overtime a few years ago. Um, so yeah, it's just making these small kind of incremental changes to try and make it a system that really recognizes these workers. And there will have to be changes because people right. are just going to keep getting older and people are well, living longer and people need these services. And I think Sam. That's, an, that's what the pandemic is showing, right? That yeah, you know, right. changes need to be made. Yeah. Kim, you want to, you want to. Yeah. I just wanted to say that um, it's just amazing that, that we don't value um, the workers. Um, you know, they take care of the most valuable and precious things in our society. When you really think about it, like they take care of our children, they take care of our elders, they take care of people with disabilities, they go into our homes, which is our, our, our private homes, you know, and, and they care for them. Um, we like to say in the domestic worker move me, movement that they um, they make all, all other work possible. Um, right. They play such a, a vital role in our economy. They make it for they make it so that the rest of us can go out and and live the lives that we want to and build build those lives for our children. Um, that's why for us in the domestic worker movement, we really try to invest in what we call culture shift and culture change, you know, because it really is about what you said, Sam, really bringing our society to a place where we value that work. Part of the reason that work hasn't been valued, we've touched on the racism part of it and the legacy there, but also it's women's work. Yeah. And um, women's work hasn't been ever been valued. You know, whether a woman does that work in her home for pay or outside of the home, you know? So the the work that we're doing, uh, I believe, and that Amanda is doing, you know, is pretty uh, revolutionary work, you know? The challenge to actually get our culture to see this as valuable work is tied to so many other um, fights that we're having in the world. Yeah, I mean, I'm really glad you brought that up. I and mean, what we're talking about here is sexism, racism, we're talking about patriarchy, uh, you know, the, and, and the wages for house, wages for housework uh, battle has been going on for decades. I mean, I think in the 70s in Italy, there was a lot of clamoring for the fact that women should be paid for the work they're doing at home because the work they're doing at home is allowing their husbands to go out and make money in the economy and bring it back. Like they're actually economically earning and they weren't being paid because they're women. I mean, so sexism and racism are, I think, you can't overstate how, how destructive the, the, those things have been. Um, 
Well, what I mean to move from the legacy, which I think is pretty clear, to to some some solutions or things that could be done to improve. And I mean, obviously, there are huge social changes that could happen. I mean, things with undocumented workers. I mean, sexism and racism. You know, those are the big battles. But but what could be done, I guess, in the next uh, in the next few months, especially related to the pandemic and what workers are going through right now? Kim. Oh uh, yeah, um, uh, we have. I want to give what my comments just a little bit of a frame. Uh, you know, this issue of health and safety for workers um, that has become so clear and um, the need to prioritize this issue um, really came to light for our base here in California actually last year uh, before the COVID pandemic. Uh, we saw this issue come up with these the health pandemic and also the 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 wildfires that came up um, where we saw employers uh, across California, primarily in Southern California, really asking workers to do things that were really um, having an impact on their health and safety, such as right. be first responders, uh, such as uh, stay behind the fires to actually like fight those fires, stay behind to protect pets, water stables, um, things that don't fit into the job description of a domestic worker that are really putting domestic workers' health and safety at risk. And so now with the pandemic that's happening and the issues that Amanda has brought up, um, we've realized that domestic workers are actually one of the few um, industries that are excluded from health and safety protections in California. Um, these are protections that you and I, Sam, as workers every day enjoy. Um, we actually get protected if we're exposed or you know, the employer doesn't say something to us. Um, and so that's what the, co the Domestic Worker Coalition is working on right now. Um, we're trying to get rid of that exemption that is as long as we just talked about from the 1930s um, that would bring domestic workers under the umbrella of Cal OSHA and provide some guidelines um, at the state level uh, for employers and for domestic workers, particularly around what Amanda mentioned, PPE, the need for PPE, and other guidelines, training, and information that would actually prevent a lot of these issues um, from happening. Yeah, Kim, I just want to underscore one thing you said that I find is really sort of sick and twisted, which is a lot of these workers, domestic workers, IHSS workers, they, they, they love what they do, they're proud of what they do, and they don't want to abandon uh, people. They want to continue working. They want to do a good job, even though they're getting paid so little. These people, they really, and and, uh, and that could sort of be used to make people do things that are unsafe. Uh, you know, you could get, you know, you have a nanny who really loves a child, so the nanny's going to compromise herself to do the right thing for the child. You have an IHSS worker who is taking care of someone, they, they will, you know, put themselves at risk to take care of them. So that, you know, I don't know, it's just something that you see often and, and people don't talk about it, have that leverage to make people do the work. Um, so yeah, Amanda, what about concrete things for IHSS? I mean, we talked about this a little, but is there, is there, um, like, like, I guess, and if you're a viewer and you wanted to do something, uh, is there something you could do locally in your county? Is there a ballot initiative? Like, what, like, what, or legislation? What, what, what could they get behind? Sure. Well, on a, I mean, when we engage with our members, we always make sure that they know their rights and how they can be vocal in their community and at the state level. So we do have our members engage directly with legislators at the Capitol. Um, right now, because the state budget was just released, I, I, I don't know how many people are really tuning into that, but because we're in such a bad economic situation in the state, a lot of things are being put on the table to potentially be cut. And one of those is unfortunately IHSS um, depending on federal funding that may or may not come in, our program is in danger of being cut. So right now, that's one of our biggest priorities. We are, you know, calling our legislators and doing virtual lobby visits. We're trying to be really creative in this moment to make sure that our voices are still heard. I would encourage anyone, if they're interested in seeing, you know, how they can get involved on social media and any of our campaigns that we're doing is just to go to SEIU2015.org. Um, it has all the information about any actions we're taking or anything that you can get involved in. Even if you're not um, a home care provider or long-term care worker, we welcome 
all the support that we can get in this moment. Um, we want to make sure that we're also not losing sight of what we're bargaining for. We do have active bargaining going on in certain counties. So we're trying not to let things get completely put on hold because we know that you know, workers are relying on um, us to represent them at the table and do what we can in this moment to advance their wages and benefits in spite of what's going on. So right. like I said, our biggest issue or campaign you will right now is, is the budget because everything is so in flux that um, I don't know that we will be introducing any legislation um, in the immediate future. Right now, we're trying to protect the programs, make sure our workers get the PPE and hazard pay. And if they need sick time, we want to make sure that they get that and any other benefits as well. And I just want to, uh, a listener wanted to know if this issue that, that we're facing here in California is something specific to the state or national. So yeah, I'll let either of you guys weigh in on that. Um, I would think that it's it's everywhere for long-term care workers. I, I, I'm not familiar with what every state is doing in terms of their policies around PPE or hazard pay. I, I think different states are doing different things, but I think in general, long-term care workers are really facing a crisis and domestic workers. Um, we've all seen the news stories of nursing homes, how they're been huge outbreaks in, in a lot of different facilities. They are just completely overwhelmed. So I think that that's a pretty consistent thing that's going on across the country. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, you know, our we would call it our mothership, the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Um, uh, basically, our members across the country are going through the same situation. Um, the National Alliance has been able to establish a care fund uh, for domestic workers, and so uh, we've been able to provide some some resources to 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 our members across the country. Right, to and support I would not, them. Right, I would not imagine that other places in the country don't have sexism or racism or places where people don't earn enough money to you know take care of their sick and friends and family. So yeah, definitely a national issue. Um, again, uh, we talked about some small fixes, but what if you guys could really think big? Like what? If you could remake this system, or if you if you want to encourage a listener to to think about uh, redefining this, like what would we be looking at? I mean, are we talking about uh, you know fundamentally changing uh, compensation, or um, you know change, undocumented workers changing that whole system? I mean, what are we what are we talking about to actually really make this work well? Well, I can say, like in California, we we are. Um, Leaders, you know, we know that in California, every worker, regardless of their status, um, gets basic protections um, to an extent. Um, but at the national level, what the alliance has been doing with its affiliates, which we're a part of, is really focusing on um, introducing the National Domestic Worker Bill of Rights um, that uh, broadly provides some of the protections that we talked about being that workers are excluded from. Um, as a starting point for that conversation. We know that during this time that would be a, a challenge, but it's also very important to educate the, at the national level, legis our legislators about the issues that impact domestic workers. Um, there are different things that uh, domestic workers are doing across the country. They're passing standards boards um, at municipal levels. Um, and they're also looking at other ways to support themselves like portable benefits. Um, that domestic workers work with um, can can benefit from. Uh, these are all ordinances that are being passed in Philadelphia or in Seattle um, to try to bring the industry some equity. Um, Amanda, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that those are all really fantastic things that are happening. And I just wanted to also raise up that um, here in California, uh, Governor Newsom created the Master Plan on Aging, which is, I think, really speaking to what you brought up, Sam, about what we what we want to do when we look at the whole system in California, when we look at the healthcare system, and in particular, long-term care, because we are such a huge state and so diverse, and we're going to have so many people that need these services and that need them now. What are we doing 
um, when we look at the system as a whole. And we've been engaged in those conversations. We have um, our policy director who sits on um, that committee that's working on the master plan of aging. So we are trying to think about what does it look like to make sure that every person in California does have long-term care when they need it? Um, right. and that means everyone from who gets IHSS to people who need to pay out of pocket um, to people that may have private insurance. So we want to make sure that, you know, if you need long-term care, you should be able to get it. And right. if you're a long-term care worker, you should be getting a living wage and benefits and be recognized as an essential worker all the time. So it's linking those two things, the demand of it and the people that are actually providing the care. We need to make an integrated system that's really recognizing that and setting some standards statewide. And one point that I want to make, oh, go ahead, Kim. Oh, I just wanted to echo what Amanda said. The, the California Domestic Workers Coalition also sits at that table. Uh, we believe that um, the struggle of the caregiver is also connected to the person receiving the care that in many cases just can't afford care um, right. and struggles every day to, 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 make, to make it right. Yeah, I mean, in that sense of what we were talking about before, I mean, the very privileged person who hires a cleaner and a, and a nanny, sometimes it's done out of privilege, sure, but sometimes it's done because we just, even upper middle class workers in America don't have time to take care of their kids or cook or clean, which is insane. I mean, how can we live in such a wealthy society and not have the ability to do basic things? Um, so I think, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and something that I've been thinking a lot about is it's very easy to think of domestic workers or ISS workers or undocumented workers as somehow different from the regular workforce. But if you look at what's happened in this country over the last, you know, since the late 70s, you know, since Reaganomics in the late 70s, you've seen companies chip away at employee protections and employee benefits and pay and unions. And workers have been moved from employees to contractors. Workers have been temped. Workers have been, uh, and now uh, uh, they're gig workers working for Uber and Lyft, which are, you know, extremely contingent. And you can look at, you know, an undocumented domestic worker as a progression in that change chain that the system really enjoys. Because again, if you look at the shift from employees to, to gig workers, what you're seeing is corporations and companies, employers having less responsibility, having to pay less benefits, being able to say, hey, you know, there's a pandemic, we're not going to pay you anymore. Um, so IHSS workers and domestic workers are sort of part of that continuum. I mean, this is something that our system really likes is having a worker where you're not responsible. You know, if something happens like, well, sorry. Um, so I think yeah, I don't know if you guys want to speak to that because again, it gets back to this thing that we were talking about is uh, of just um, how we how we we like to view these workers as other. Like they're they're not part of this system. They're you know, I mean, they maybe don't even deserve wages because it's women's work. You know, like there's this whole uh, 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 kind of uh, put in a different bucket, if you will. Yeah, um, we like to say that domestic workers are the original gig workers. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right. And then you know, I've heard many a testimony from workers that are, as we know, many women have started to work for these apps um, and they go into a home and they go clean the home and there are very strict rules around what you said, Sam, um, that they're not allowed, they have to sign a contract that they're not allowed to talk to the employer. Right. Oh my God. In any way, shape or form, because the last thing that they want is for the employer to establish a relationship with the worker. Right. And cut out the middleman, uh, you know, online tech platform that's, you know, swiping a little bit of money from every, yeah. from every transaction. So that's the future of work. Right. And I guess that's just something to think about is that what we really need to be doing is taking domestic workers and IHSS workers and moving them back to the employee standard, employment standards we had in the 60s in this country. I mean, it was strong unions and pay and benefits, not moving everybody else towards what you guys, what you two have been fighting so hard against. Yeah, just a, just to touch on that a little bit more, IHSS is a very unique employment situation because they are have essentially three different employers. The person they care for directs their work, but that person isn't paying them. Um, the state and the county split responsibility as the employer of record for IHSS. So it gets really complicated about who is going to take responsibility to provide benefits and whether they're considered state or county workers. And again, it really largely depends on what county you happen to work in um, and what resources you have available for you through your local county IHSS office. So it really is a very complex system when 
IHS's workers are very isolated. They don't really have an employer to even go to. Um, that's why we're here is to, you know, provide that link so that they do have a voice and they can connect with other workers and connect with the state and their politicians. Um, because really there is no official one employer for IHSS right. it makes things even more difficult. And I guess, I don't know, that to me just, it, it's such an, so indicative of a, of a messed up society. It's like, here's the most important thing. Someone, your family member, or your community gets sick. And the way we're trying to do it is like, okay, we'll have the state and the county and someone's going to pay and they're not going to pay them that much. It just seems, it's like such a, it's such a mess. Yeah. Um, well, in terms of the pandemic, uh, and now, I mean, we're talking about in California, the lockdowns easing and people going back to work and going back into homes. Um, yeah, just what are the kinds of things now that your workers are going to be uh, that are going to be hard and challenging and difficult uh, for them navigating, you know, maybe returning to work? Wow, uh, I will say like it's it's still been very, very challenging for our communities. Um, at this time, um, there's still a lot of fear, you know, as the data, as we're starting to see the data show that um, you mentioned this, Sam, that, um, or actually um, the CEO from Blue Shield mentioned that um, many of the, of the Latino workers are like, have a high percentage of COVID, you know, mm -hmm. um, because they have no choice. They have to go out there and take public transportation. I was driving by a bus here in San Francisco the other day and it was packed wow. and I just couldn't help to think, my God, you know, um, and it's definitely probably because people feel they have to go to work, you know, right. so there's still a lot of fear. We're trying to provide members with as much education as we can, um, but there's desperation in their voices. They, right. they, they, they don't have a, the choice they have to make is a difficult one. So they're wanting to go back to work. I mean, essentially, what we've what we've done is they're economically in such a rough position that when the lockdown is starting to end and they could go back to work, but it's dangerous, they might, you know, they're going to put their bodies, they're going to sacrifice their bodies. I mean, that's where we're at. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Amanda. Uh, yeah, with lockdown, does that really change ISSS workers yeah. work that much? I mean, honestly, most IHSS and even nursing home workers have been working through the pandemic, just because of the work that they do, it, it really hasn't stopped and they're classified as essential workers regardless. Um, I think the biggest thing that they've struggled with is what happens if, if their consumer does test positive and what that means for them as a care worker. Um, and if they have to self-isolate, same thing on the nursing home side, there's outbreaks in the facilities and what do they do if they don't have sick time? Um, they've basically just been going in anyway and risking it, you know, because they can't afford to not go in. Um, so I don't think that there has been a lot of work stoppage um, mm -hmm. unless, you know, you have yourself gotten sick and, and you have no other choice but to um, self-quarantine. I think going forward, though, the workers are just nervous about what this means and how long this is going to last because, you know, we could be in this situation for a very long time. So um, they may have PPE, PPE today, but what about in a couple months if there's right. an outbreak or their consumer gets sick then? So I think those are the questions that are coming up is even if, you know, things relatively go back to normal or they haven't um, been impacted yet, but we know that this isn't just going to end tomorrow. So I think there's a lot of unanswered questions there. And again, what, what can individuals do? Uh, I mean, we, uh, uh, we could break this down into types of individuals. Um, but I mean, I mean, should, should people try to be donating money? Should they, uh, yeah. What, what can an individual person do who's upset about this system and wants to change it? I would besides say that, besides overthrowing the patriarchy and yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> I mean, one of the big things that people can do is contact their representative. There's websites online where you can put in your address and it'll connect you with your representative in the federal government. So um, there's been a couple care packages that have passed that have provided some relief. And there's one huge one being voted on right now um, to provide additional relief. And in that package does include um, hazard pay and additional extended um, benefits for people. So 
I think that's one of the biggest thing you can do is contact your representative and let them know that this is an issue you care about and that you want these um, bills passed. Um, you can also get involved in your local um, local government issues. You know, you can contact um, if you have a board of supervisors um, in your county, like here in Los Angeles. That's a you know they do hold a certain amount of power. Our board of supervisors here. Um, we were able to pass a local motion that um, provides some protections for our nursing home workers. So there are ways that you can get involved, whether you want to do that locally or on a bigger scale. Um, and it's usually really easy. You could They have automated emails you can send. That's what we do. Um, you can reach out on social media. Um, there's all different ways you can leave a voicemail to your representatives. The point is the more they hear from people that people are listening to these issues and care about them, the more likely they are to actually make changes that benefit workers and families that need it. Right. Kim? Oh, just amen to what Amanda said. Um, I think for us, you can join if you're an employer, you hire a house cleaner or a caregiver or nanny, um, and you think you want to be involved to really help change the culture and the structure, um, join hand in hand the Employers Network, um, which is a nat national organization um, that is active across the country. Um, and then hopefully as a part of Hand in Hand, uh, you could help us pass. You see it on my backdrop, AB1257, um, to repeal the exclusion of domestic work from Cal OSHA protections. And then in terms of just, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot, uh, of work that we can all do to understand things better, how we got here, uh, the way our society is structured, uh, how that causes problems. Um, what are some of the things that you would wish people would have a better understanding of? And what would you suggest to someone who like wanted to learn about like, okay, I want to know more about um, the history of how we treated domestic workers. I want to know more about uh, wages for, for housework. Like what, what would you suggest for them to, to where, where could they go to get those resources? So yeah, question one is what do you wish people understood better? And question two is where can they go to get some answers? Kim? Um, well, I would recommend um, a book. Uh, uh, it's written by uh, the founder of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. I believe it's called The Age of Dignity. Mm. Um, that really is kind of a macro perspective on how important it is for us to change the culture and how we value care work. Um, and I think that's a really important book um, that can really frame the movement for folks um, to, as, a, as a first step. Um, and I know that at the national level, we're also doing a, a research project on the history of domestic work in the United mm. States um, coming out of Smith uh, College. Um, so if they contact us here at the California Domestic Workers Coalition, we can connect people because I believe it's a beautiful piece of work that um, will provide uh, hundreds of years of history on the movement. So cadomesticworkers.org. Cool. Amanda? Yeah, again, what do you wish people had a better understanding of and where could they go to get, to get resources to learn? Yeah, I, I think I... It would be great if people did understand the the issues that face these workforces more um, and more about the work that they do and why it's so important and really the magnitude of that you know of these work workforces. Like I don't know that people really know that there are half a million home care workers in in California, and I could imagine many many domestic workers as well. So. I don't think people even realize that, that there are so many of those workers out there. So it'd be great if people understand the valuable services that they do provide. And as far as resources, again, people can reach out to our union, SCIU2015.org. We have a lot of resources on our website. We engage people on social media. Um, there are a lot of um, advocacy groups out there, too, that do amazing work around disability rights. Um, I'm happy to, you know, connect people with those resources. There's all different legal rights if that's what you need. Um, of course, there's big organizations like the ACLU. There's, there's a lot of groups that are doing amazing work, um, and I think it's 
a matter of connecting with those groups and um, understanding what they do and what resources they have. Uh, and again, I'm happy to, you know, connect people with whatever questions they have, or if I don't have the answer, um, we do work with a lot of um, other great organizations that can be helpful and informative. And yeah, let's just actually uh, hammer that home. You said there's half a million IHSS workers, roughly. Um, and Kimberly, how many uh, uh, domestic workers? Low estimate, 300,000 in California. So we're talking 800,000 people in a state with around 40 million people. So we're talking about one in 40 people is doing this work. I mean, that's just a huge, huge number of people who have uh, uh, the way the system is constructed now are, are really not getting the kind of employee protections, benefits, pay that uh, that other workers are getting. I mean, that's just, it is just sort of astonishingly big. Um, yeah, we're coming to the end of the program. Uh, I just want to ask you too if there's anything you know you would want to add above and beyond what we've talked about. Um, oh, and before we get to that, I mean, I, I was thinking one one book that I read uh, that really kind of helped me wrap my head around all this uh, is called the problem the problem with work. Um, and it is all about like alternative work and how certain work hasn't been paid. And that's where I learned about the uh, uh, wages for housework struggle. Um, that book is a piece of history, really sort of shaped how I think about things, but also really just gave me kind of, yeah, I don't know, a theoretical understanding. Um, but yeah, anything you two would want to add uh, just about the, the where your workers are at right now, what they need uh, and how people can help. I think I'll say like, thank you so much for having us. Um, really value the time and um, have a lot of respect for Amanda and SEIU 2015 and the amazing work that they're doing to bring dignity to home care providers. Um, and the one thing I'll say is like, despite all the challenges that we've just talked about, I'm astonished at the resiliency of the women that I work with and, and their strength during these challenging times. So I know we'll, we'll get through it. Yeah, I guess I have a lot of the same sentiments. Um, Kimberly, your organization does incredible work as well. I'm, I'm just happy that there's a lot of organizations out there that are supporting these workers. And the most important thing that we find is that we want our workers' voices to be heard. It's, you know, I, I work in policy and I can help pass bills and advocate and do all this work, but at the end of the day, it's really our workers' voices that matter. Um, and it's all about sharing their stories and making sure that people understand that these are human beings that are doing incredible selfless work. So I just want to remind people that, like Kimberly said, these are just individuals that are doing things that, you know, day to day that many people would never dream of doing. And especially for the wages that they're, they're doing them at. Right. All right. Well, thank you both for coming. Unfortunately, we're, we're, we've come to the end of today's program. Um, I want to thank again, the Blue Shield of California Foundation for its support of the program today. And thank you uh, for being on the panel, Kimberly Alvarenga and Amanda Steele. It was a pleasure talking with both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.